fan of what happens is like really the summer of the because this is I'm always yeah, I'm always uh never thought he that way, but I think it's gonna be like that's what it looks like. Yeah, that's like that's good one eighty P or something. Yeah, but at least see, but see, the good thing is, see, it stretches out nicely, even though it, it looks like that on the DX. So I knew not to mess with it. Well, I got YouTube going, but the thing just came right on. My laptop sounds like it's going to go to space the first time. Yeah, I mean, I'm not close. I guess I can, I can't close even one of these web pages. So I kind of bogging it down. I only got two, I don't got Phoenix. When they get yellow, that means they're barely in the screen. I've always said I'd be like to live in you know, Montana and Wyoming. Wyoming. I've never been out there in the wintertime, so that would probably change my view.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, Wayne Theater. My name is Jason, and I'm one of the uh, assistants here. Um, before we get started with tonight's presentation, I'd like to take a minute to tell you all about some things we've got going on at the Wayne. Uh, this Friday night, backed by popular demand, the uh, Studio Wayne Improvisators Improv Show will be in the Cabaret at 7.30 p.m. And on March 18th at 9 p.m., we, we will have our Sips and Giggles Improv class uh, for people 18 years of age and older. So... Sorry, you can't come if you're six. Um, <laughs> no one here's six, that's good. Okay, uh, the first half of the class will include mingling and sipping with the Studio Wing teaching artists, and the second half will be a beginning improv class complete with games and improv exercises. Uh, and this weekend, March 19th at 7 p.m., the 20th at 3 p.m., and Monday, the 21st at 10 a.m., we will have uh, the Studio Wayne's production of Willy Wonka Jr. The performance on the 21st is a student matinee, so all school students are welcome to attend. Um, and our spring musical will be the uh, musical comedy Something Rotten, starting April 21st and running for two weeks. And on May 21st, the Mall Press Brothers are going to be coming here. And uh, now our speaker for this evening, uh, Stephen Reeser. Oh, or literally anyone who wants to bum rush me and just like take me down, it doesn't matter. Right, oh, you sir, good. Huh? <laughs> All right. We didn't coordinate things 100%, but that's okay. Hey, before we bring Steve up on board today, um, I'm Joe Kuyper, uh, director of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. I just want to take a minute to thank everyone that made this lecture series possible. We had DuPont, the South River Science Team, and they have kind of put this all together for us, but also the Center for Cold Waters Restoration has been just wonderful colleagues. You've heard me talk about them uh, many times during this lecture series. So, um, you know, what is the Virginia Museum of Natural History doing here? Well, we got a little storyboard here. I think you've all heard about it. We're bringing a branch of our museum here to uh, Waynesboro, just right down the hill from here. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that uh, the rubber is hitting the road, literally, from the standpoint of getting the work done. So uh, the state has gotten behind us. Um, we are in the very near future we're going to be interviewing a number of architect and engineering teams and exhibit design firms who are going to be taking the work we did completed back in around 2019 2020 right before the pandemic and then we kind of hit that little bump in the road uh, sociologically but 
Um, had a little delay there, but we're ready to get things rolling again. At this point, uh, they are going to take all of those initial plans and really do the deep dive into them. And we're going to be selecting the specific uh, exhibit themes, the specimens we're going to be using, the building layout, all of those things over the next year or so. What happens after that? We submit all of that to the state and we move to the state's capital pool. Right there it becomes a little nebulous timeline. We could be moving dirt as early as 2023, maybe more realistically 2024. We will uh, keep everyone up to speed on that. So upcoming, we will conduct these interviews. We're going to select one of the firms. We've got a bunch of great uh, proposals in from firms around the East Coast. The firms that we're going to be interviewing have done work right here in Waynesboro. They've done work in Richmond. They've done work all over uh, the Commonwealth. So these are folks who know what they're doing and they've worked on cultural ins institutions before. We have James Madison University um, <clears throat> as our construction manager and all the experience that they bring to the table. So uh, we're ready to rock and roll. In the meantime, we're gonna continue this lecture series and uh, continue to engage the community with our colleagues in the Center of Cold Waters Restoration and other folks as well. And that said, I would like to introduce Irby Nash, who has been one of our great supporters here in the community, a member of the board of the Center for Cold Waters Restoration, and he's gonna be introducing tonight's speaker. So Irby, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Before I introduce our speaker for the evening, I'd like to announce our April 12th uh, presentation in this same series. And it's going to be entitled Effects of Climate Change on Tangier Island, which is going to be a very interesting discussion. It's going to be presented by Dr. Jonathan Miles, who is a professor of JMU, who is studying climate change as part of the, the, the work that he, do, that he does there. He is a professor of integrated sciences and technology. So I would invite you all to come out on April 12th and listen to Dr. Miles. I think I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting presentation. Well, I spent about an hour this morning on the South River fishing right in the middle of Constitution Park, right in downtown Waynesboro. There were mayflies and caddisflies all over the river, flying around, fish feeding all over the river. It was incredible. I looked up and down, and there were at least a dozen fishermen all right there in the middle of downtown Waynesboro trout fishing. This is a remarkable story that we're going to hear about tonight. In that very same spot where I was standing in 1970, there was not a living fish in that river. Nothing could survive in it due to industrial pollution and it has been a long but fabulous recovery ecologically and a remarkable treasure that we have right here in our community and tonight we're going to hear a little bit about the story of that process of restoration our speaker this evening is steve reeser he's been a fisheries biologist for the department of wildlife resources here in Virginia since 1998 and he's currently the regional fisheries manager for a 28 county region responsible for overseeing and managing the aquatic resources within the Potomac, the Shenandoah and the Rappahannock rivers, Upper James River watersheds. From 2011 to 2019 he served as the agency's statewide coordinator for cold water streams and trout management. If you want to know where the fish are, this is the guy to go talk to. He knows where the fish are. Trust I may, me. I may not tell you, though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Steve has been a close personal friend of mine for years, and I can assure you that there is no one with, who is more knowledgeable and is of greater integrity and dedication to natural resource restoration in, a, in the Valley and in Virginia than Steve Reese. So let's welcome him with a warm round of applause. Steve. Well, thanks, Irby. Thanks for that introduction. Um, 
And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight to learn about, you know, some of the efforts of multiple partners uh, that have been responsible for developing trout fishing opportunities in South River in this Waynesboro vicinity over the past 30 years. Let me get my slide here. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, so I wanted to give you an outline of what I'd be sharing with you tonight. First, some of the historical background on the fish communities that call South River home. Uh, then talk about the degradation of the South River's habitat, particularly water quality, that occurred from the late 1800s through the probably the 1960s. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. And then the recovery of the South River through improvements of water quality over the last 50 years. Then explain the reasoning behind these efforts or interest in developing trout fishing opportunities in the South River, utilizing the unique uh, spring groundwater resources that I'm going to go in detail about that are, make it possible to uh, develop these, fish, these trout fishing opportunities. And I struggled with what was the best way to tell this story on how these fisheries were developed. You know, should I do it chronologically over time? Uh, because these, some of these different fisheries I'm going to talk about here uh, occurred at different times. But you know, the biologist in me normally approaches things, you know, looking either downstream or upstream when surveying a stream, and so I thought I'd do it that way. And uh, so along the way, uh, I'll give you a timeline of when these fisheries were developed, the fishing regulations that, that are in place for each fishery, habitat improvement projects that have been completed in these various reaches. And since each of these trout fisheries are currently uh, sub sustained by stocking hatchery or trout, explain the stocking strategies that have been investigated and researched and then share some of the data that our agency has collected to help evaluate the management of these different fisheries. And uh, lastly, I plan to, plan to explain how these trout fisheries are economically important to the Waynesboro and surrounding area. You can see that some of the logos from some of the, the partners uh, on this slide that were responsible for the development of these trout fisheries. Um, and there's a few other entities that I'll mention along the way tonight. But at this time, I'd like to, to mention and acknowledge several individuals uh, who have provided data, information, slides, even shared some slides or borrowed some slides uh, for this presentation. First off, Irby Nash here. And again, Irby, uh, thanks for inviting me to, uh, to share this story about the, the trout fisheries uh, restoration in, in South River. And Irby's also been instrumental in providing some of the data and background for some of the groundwater resources, which are really instrumental in, in, the, in developing these trout fisheries. Uh, Tom Benzing, uh, who I believe is in the audience here. Hi, Tom. Uh, Tom has uh, done a lot of research and data collection, particularly investigating the water temperature spatially uh, uh, throughout the South River. And I'm going to share some of that data here. Tom's also uh, a, a, a an officer with Virginia Council of Trout Unlimited. And then uh, Calvin Jordan with the Department of Environmental Quality. I'm not sure if he's in the audience, but Calvin uh, has been very active with the South River Science team. And uh, I, uh, he's loaned me some slides to talk about some of the historic fish community information and some other information about South River. And then lastly, I want to uh, thank and acknowledge you know, members of the local uh, Shenandoah Valley chapter of Trout Unlimited, uh, Tommy Lawhorn, uh, Harold Tate, and others for you know, providing some of the, the pictures that you're going to see here and some of the, uh, the data about the, the private trout stockings that have taken place and a lot of work that, that that organization has done in opening up some of these fisheries to the public. But lastly, and, and Irby reminded me of this this morning when I talked to him the other day, that there were two individuals that we've got to acknowledge here that were really that got this ball rolling back in the 1980s with, with the kind of pushing and, uh, and uh, you know, really working on the Department of Wildlife Resources at the time to stock some trout in South River. And those two individuals were DeBose Eggleston and the late Corbin Dixon. So that without them, this, we may not be here today. Okay, this is a, a photo, what, typically what the, the South River looks like up in the Lyndhurst area. Uh, this is in the headwaters of the Shenandoah River watershed that ultimately drains into the Chesapeake Bay. I want to mention the headwater tributaries of the South River. 
that flow off the Blue Ridge, uh, particularly the Big Levels area, and then farther to the north off of the Shenandoah National Park are very soft uh, and often infertile and often referred to as freestone streams. And they, are, they, they, uh, they suffer from low flows, particularly in the summer, but they are cold enough in, in temperature to support wild brook trout populations, which, by the way, are the, the brook trout is the only native trout to Virginia. Uh, tributaries uh, of Upper South River that come from the, the west and the extreme headwaters that originate in the Greenville area um, are important. And one thing to note about that that really provi provides the productivity and the water quality for these, these trout fishery development is that the river, the, 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 the valley floor, the lime, is, the, is limestone karstiology, and it's essential for providing the minerals and nutrients to create a, a quite fertile environment for fish and other aquatic organisms. And it's in this headwater area we're going to talk about tonight, particularly once we get to Lipscomb area, downstream to Waynesboro, that this karstiology allows significant groundwater aquifers to come to the surface and feed the South River with cold, high-quality water. This is another uh, slide here of a, a picture of the South River up in this uh, upper area in the Lyndhurst area. Some anglers there are enjoying, enjoying that. And then as you move downstream, this is in town. This is, you can see this kind of dates this photo here uh, before the Greenway development. This kind of give you what the habitat in the South River uh, is centered around. But before we get into the development of the trout fisheries, because I think that's what everybody wants to hear about tonight, let's talk about what the fish community was like in the South River in the Swainsboro area pre-European uh, settlement. I would think it looked vastly different than it does today. According to the Fishes of Virginia by Bob Jenkins, there were, have been over 58 different species of fish documented in the South Fork Shenandoah River, which includes the South River. And uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that quite a few species uh, that, that are currently uh, wild reproducing in the South River are non-native uh, and they are some of those species that are of interest of anglers would be the smallmouth bass, a largemouth bass, rock bass, bluegill, some other sunfish species, channel catfish and the like. But on this slide here uh, I have a selection of some of the more common native fish species found in the South River. You may notice that one of the sport fish that's on this slide uh, up in the upper left corner here, the brook trout uh, is historically uh, been found living in the South River watershed. And I'm going to discuss a little bit later on here that the, uh, some of the different trout species that we're stocking in uh, South River to, to develop these fisheries. But I want to go more into detail about the spatial distribution of wild brook trout historically in the South River. And we'll do that in a little bit. Uh, Calvin Jordan shared, me, uh, shared with me this slide that he had put together for another presentation. Uh, we don't really know how the South River looked in the Waynesboro area pre-European settlement. Most likely it was narrower and deeper, uh, possibly had more complex habitat, and was probably less silty or less from sedimentation than it currently is today. Uh, what led to the changes of the South River to what we see today? Obviously, clearing of the forests in the 1800s had a significant impact. This was mostly in the headwaters on the Blue Ridge, uh, also in the valley, but there was a, quite a bit of uh, what they term uh, savanna-type habitat in the valley floor uh, historically. And there was a steady increase in intensive agriculture, as you can see here. This is a, a picture of the uh, upper watershed, the South River watershed. And all these uh, perturbations on the land, land use changes, led to soil erosion, sedimentation, channel de destabilization at times over time, leading to less diverse habitat in a wider and shallower South River. And along with that, there was a, a loss and destruction of the, the uh, necessary repairing areas along many of the stream corridors in South River and the tributaries it's in South River proper uh, that led to uh, soil erosion, sedimentation, which is ne negatively affects aquatic organisms and fish, 
also would also lead to increasing uh, water temperatures and uh, and also nutrient inputs from these intensive agriculture practices so but the biggest change that's occurred on the landscape that's impacted south river particularly in the waynesboro area and downstream throughout the, the entirety of south river clear to where it's confluence with the, the, the north river in port republic has been urban and industrial development. Here, this is a, a, a satellite image from, from Google Earth uh, showing the downtown area here. The South River runs through the middle. You can see uh, that's Constitution Park and then the Invista complex uh, to the bottom of the screen there. But Basic City and Waynesboro were founded here, were developed here because of the water resources of the South River. And those, uh, large amounts of, of groundwater, those groundwater resources are also uh, on the landscape here. So those two things were the reason for this, you know, Waynesboro to be located where it is. And so all this increased impervious surface, increased nutrients, increased runoff, uh, non-point source pollution, point source pollution, industrial pollution is all led, led to terrible water quality. Uh, here's another slide I borrowed from uh, Calvin Jordan. Um, where if you were an angler or a paddler, you, you steered clear of the South River from Waynesboro downstream. It, it, as, as Irby said earlier or somebody, the, uh, the South River was biologically dead by the 1960s in downtown Waynesboro and, and throughout, throughout the rest of South River downstream. And so let's look at what the fish community looked like or, and it still does look like over time upstream of Waynesboro. So there were some fishery surveys that were conducted there in 1890, which is wonderful data to look at historically. And over time, you can see the things that they, this is a number of different fish species found there in subsequent surveys over the years. And so it's remained relatively steady. And I wouldn't read too much into this, this data because our, our fish collection method methodologies with electric fishing are a lot more efficient than what they had with name, set, uh, seines and nets back in 1890. So I'm not sure that that's real representative of what was out there in 1890. But this slide here really tells a story about that industrial pollution and its effects on the uh, aquatic community, the biology of the river. And, and the, the royal blue bars there, the, 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 the data from 1970, this is the total number of fish species you can see above Waynesboro. There were around 20 collected, and once we get to Waynesboro, it was zero, and it only gets up to four species when you get to Port Republic, and, uh, and so you can. See, but you can see that recovery uh, by 2006, which was the next major fishery survey, and then in 2010. So that's the good news. So what happened after 1970? Why did the fish community improve to this point? I think the most, the single most uh, important uh, event that uh, led to this was the, the Clean Water Act, 1972. So the formation of the, the Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, wa State Water Control Board, and you know, it's, which by the way, is, I stole that logo. It's 50 years old this year, so you know, celebrate that. And uh, but there's also been uh, ex increased efforts in, rest in repairing restoration in the upper watershed. That certainly led to the improvement over time as well. So I want to, you know give credit for, for that as well. So, so we've reviewed the recovery of the South River in the Waynesboro area and downstream over the past 50 years. Talked about the, you know, the improvements from the Clean Water Act. So why the deliberate focus and effort placed on developing trout fisheries throughout the South River over the past 30, 40 years? Well, starting as early as the late 1800s, the U.S. Fisheries Commission at that time was the, the, the government agency that was uh, responsible for managing and developing fisheries uh, throughout the country. And they had, they had uh, officers in, in Virginia, and their one main management strategy back in the late 1800s was, was stocking, stocking hatchery fish, uh, other, all species, but a lot were trout. And, uh, and this was to provide recreational fishing where native sport fish stocks and even commercial stocks have been severely degraded or even totally extirpated from Virginia waters. 
And then that, along that same time, a few years later, starting in the 1930s, uh, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, which is now the Department of Wildlife Resources, uh, built cold water fish hatcheries. The, the earliest was the Montebello Hatchery in, in nearby in Nelson County and began to stock hatchery trout throughout Virginia. Trout, by the way, are also one of the easiest fish to propagate and culture, uh, uh, to grow to a catchable size that's uh, uh, attracted, attractive to anglers, and that you can provide instant recreational fishing. So that's, that was really the push for, fish, for trout. And Virginia anglers like trout. So we've done some statewide uh, angler surveys in 2009 and 2016 here and you know anglers are asked what species they, they prefer to fish for and trout are usually in the top five um, and here you know we've not really broken down by species some are you know families that's you know stock trout but so they're very popular with anglers and in Virginia in Virginia to fish for hatchery trout in our designated stock trout waters you have to have a, a uh, separate trout fishing license in, in, in also in, in advance of your uh, freshwater fishing license. And so we, for a long time, have always been able to know how many trout anglers we have in Virginia. And, and it's, a, it's a big, uh, they're, they're a big portion of our constituents in, from, from fisheries management standpoint. And so currently we, we know we probably have between uh, 80,000 to 100,000 trout anglers in Virginia. So it's, that's another reason why trout are important to not only our anglers, but they're important to our agency because of that. Well, let's talk a little bit about the different species of trout that are being stocked and managed in South River. Uh, first off, you know, you're, it's gonna come to, to light here, trout, all trout, all three of these species need cold water to survive. They cannot survive at temperatures greater than the mid 70s Fahrenheit for short periods. Uh, and they may not reproduce successfully or, or produce viable eggs with temperatures that, that reach above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the first fish on top here, on the top of the slide, is the brook trout. Again, it's the only native uh, trout species to Virginia. It's a fall spawner, spawns in October, November in Virginia. It is also requires the coldest water temperature of all the three trout species we're going to talk about here. Um, there are currently uh, wild populations uh, of, of brook trout in the headwater tributaries that I mentioned earlier of, of South River. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about here more in brook trout here in just a second, just in a minute when I, after I introduce the rainbow and brown trout. Um, the middle fish here is the rainbow trout. It is not native to Virginia. It's, uh, they're native to Pacific Northwest. This has probably been the most propagated, moved around, stocked, established uh, trout species or fish species in the world. Um, they're, they're found in every continent except Antarctica. And I think if we look close enough there, we might find some there. And I, you know, Irby, I know you've caught them in Hawaii. Yeah. So they, uh, and they're, our hatchery system, 70% um, of the trout that we raise in our cold water hatcheries are rainbow trout. And it's probably higher than that for the private hatcheries that provide fish for, for landowners in Virginia. You know, so the private hatcheries in Virginia, probably it's 70 to 80% of the trout that they raise uh, are rainbows. Uh, it, it can uh, uh, survive in, in a little bit warmer water temperatures than the brook trout, but it is one of the most propagated uh, species uh, in the world. And lastly here, uh, not to you know, say that it's any less, less important or less popular, is the brown trout. It's also non-native, uh, not native to North America. It's native to Europe. It was brought here in the, in the late 1800s, propagated. It's been stu it's stocked all over the country. There are wild natural reef producing populations throughout the US, North America, also in Virginia. Uh, it can, it's, it's a fall spawner like the brook trout and it can tolerate warmer temperatures, water temperatures than the brook or rainbow, uh, you know, even in more degraded habitats. So it's, but it is very popular with anglers. 
Uh, I think it's, you know, it's been written about. It's a little more difficult to catch. It's more, a little more wily, uh, but it is uh, sought after and requested by, uh, by anglers, particularly fly fishermen. I wanted to, I said I wanted to talk a little bit more about brook trout just to kind of give some perspective here that they are, are native salmonid in, uh, in the South River. We have, there is no um, historical evidence, data, that they ever existed in a, in a population that would, that would support a fishery in the South River proper. Um, and so now that's going back to when we had data. So were they there, uh, you know, pre-Civil War in the 1700s? Uh, I don't know. We don't have data. There's no, there's no any, uh, not any, even any uh, anecdotal information where, you know, somebody wrote in their journal about catching speckled trout in the South River, you know, in this, in this vicinity. So, but we have uh, collected some adult wild brook trout, very few now, just a few individuals, in South River, right where Baker Spring enters in downtown. And so they, you know, there again, there are other systems in the east where the conditions uh, are there for these wild trout to reproduce, you know, and, and live, live well in the tributaries because of temperature, but they can move down into the larger bodies of water downstream and survive during the, the colder months, but when the summer, warm summer temperatures drive them away. So that's, you know, there's a possibility there that that is happening here. Uh, and, we, and there's evidence that these brook trout will move from stream to stream by having to travel through, you know, the, Shen the South Fork Shenandoah River or the South River. So just wanted to mention that as we, as we think about, you know, stocking some of these fish, these species in South River. So to sum it up, in summary here, why trout? Why trout in the South River? Well, you know, Virginia anglers like them. They're popular. And the South River here in the Waynesboro area exhibits some of the habitat attributes that are necessary to support these trout fisheries. Wow. And as a bonus, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it became apparent that in the, in the 20 teens here, where there were some trophy-sized brown trout like this one caught here that were being caught out of the South River here in downtown Waynesboro. And so that, that gained a lot of interest. You know, that, that put a spotlight on what the potential could be here for, the, for developing a fishery in downtown Waynesboro and you know, what it means you know, economically for, for, the, for the area, for the, for the city. And uh, so it's, it's drawn a lot of, of uh, angler attention and as Irby mentioned, you know, he was down there today and, he, and there was, you know, a dozen, a dozen other anglers enjoying the South River along with him. So, so why has it been possible to develop and sustain many of these trout fisheries in the South River, this upper South River? It's the unique abundance of cold water, this groundwater spring, spring water. This is a, a picture of City Spring up in the Lyndhurst area, uh, upstream of Shalom Road. Uh, it's entering the South River there in the background, and notice the temperature. These 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 temperatures of these springs are in, in the mid 50s Fahrenheit degrees Fahrenheit, and so that's essential for cooling down the main South River, particularly in the summer months, where trout can uh, you know feel warm and fuzzy through the summer. Uh, here's a, a map that was was uh, created and, and provided to me by Irby Nash that, that shows. Uh, the location of, of some of these significant groundwater springs at, at the end of the South River upstream of, uh, of the city. And uh, so these are significant spring inputs. Uh, for the location here, rep, you, know, you can reference the, the location of the key foods there in the upper middle left of the map. And if you move downstream closer to the city, uh, here again, this, this was constructed by, by Irby, uh, the significant input spring inputs the South River. Notice the quantities, which are gallons per minute. Uh, they range from several hundred to several thousand gallons per minute. So that's a significant amount of groundwater. And that is, that is what is instrumental in creating these cool water habitats that, that these fish, these trout can survive through the summer months, also grow and prosper. So a little 
you know, come up more looking closer at some of these springs. This is the most significant. This is Baker Spring downtown at the, it, it comes in on the eastern side of the river uh, there at the upper end of the Invista property. 3,000 gallons per minute. It's a significant uh, flow of, of cold water. There again, that 56 degree Fahrenheit essential. This is, this does a lot to, to decrease the temperature of water throughout the entire South River for, you know, miles downstream. Another, another sp significant spring is Coiner Spring. This is just south of Interstate 64. Again, notice the cold temperature year round here, and, you know, 1,500 gallons per minute. So these inputs of cold spring water are what make possible habitat conditions where trout can survive year round in many reaches of the South River. Not all reaches, just you know, particular reaches, which we'll go into detail here more in the area of Upper South River from the headwaters downstream to North Park. That's kind of the area we're talking about here from, from Lipscomb to North Park primarily. Uh, this graph shows stream temperature data collected by Dr. Tom Benzing where he was uh, doing some research and some analysis of looking at uh, temperatures uh, on uh, putting out a, a data logging uh, temperature sensors, to, you know, taking a temperature every hour, leaving them out there in the stream at these locations for, for a year at a time, and then you know, downloading that data. And remember that these, uh, on the, on the uh, x-axis here, were from Lipscomb Road downstream to Basic Park. That's the, the stretch of the river that we're talking about here. Remember, trout cannot survive at water temperatures greater than the mid 70s. And I need to mention that um, that the duration that the trout are exposed to these high temperatures is also a, a major factor. So what's shown here in the, the red, green, and blue symbols indicates the, temp, the, the one, seven, and 14 day maximum temperature uh, that, that occurred in those areas. And so the, uh, the take home here from this graph is to show that how groundwater inputs provide trout habit from just upstream, upstream of City Spring, downstream to near the Lyndhurst USGS gauge, and then the river becomes too warm for trout in the summer, in the summer months now, not, not, not year round, for trout to survive from there downstream to where Baker Spring enters the river, which we showed a picture of there in, in, in downtown, and then the river that helps keep the river cool enough for trout throughout Constitution Park, down to North Park. And then once again, we see the temperatures increasing as we get closer to Basic Park. You know, basically we're, we're losing habitat for trout in the summertime. And I need to mention now that with this cold groundwater, this cold spring water, not only the temperature is important, but because this uh, water is flowing through karst limestone geology, uh, it's very uh, productive and it is great for trout food. You know, macroinvertebrate aquatic insect populations uh, really, really do well uh, f because of this, this groundwater. And all trout of all ages uh, rely heavily on aquatic insects for food throughout all their life stages. And so what we see with these springs in the upper South River is, is water quality characteristics that are similar to classic chalk streams or limestone spring creeks that, uh, that anglers uh, are no, know about that they're known to sustain quality trout fisheries. So you've got the temperature from this groundwater that's important to keep the water cold. We have the karst geology, that, that the water quality that's really uh, doing great things for the, 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 the macro intervertes and, and aquatic insects. And that all equals quality trout, like this one here that, that Tom Benzing is, is uh, posing for from the South River. Okay, now, as I said, I'm going to go over these different fisheries, and I'm going to call them fisheries or fishing opportunity, f trout fishing opportunities. And we're going to work our way upstream down. Um, the first one is going to discuss the, uh, the South River uh, Special Regulation Area, which is also known is this SRA. And you can see here it is located from just upstream of Shalom Road, downstream to Oak Lane Bridge in the Lyndhurst area. And here's a, this, uh, this section of river was opened to public fishing in 2011. This is up in that area near where City Spring enters the 
the South River. Uh, members of the Shenandoah Valley chapter of Toronto Limited, they went door to door and met with each landowner along this stretch of river uh, to sell this idea, this program about developing a trout fishery and to obtain public access to it. That was, that was the, the big reason that they were out there. Um, to get and getting buy-in from the largest landowner in this reach, which was Waynesboro Nurseries, was critical to making this possible. So whenever the Department of Wildlife Resources wants to get involved with developing a public fishery, uh, we not only we need access, but we need at least a minimum of about a mile of water before we would be, uh, start to stock fish or, or manage it. And so we have, there are approximately three miles of, of stream here as part of this program. Uh, so it met that criteria for sure. And you can see some of the partners there and some of the funding that, that was allocated to develop these maps and, and build, construct some parking areas and some kiosks and things like that. So in 2011, the original fishing regulations were two trout per day, 16 inch, inches uh, in length, minimum size, single put, point hook artificial lures only. Uh, the regulations were changed to this SRA to fly fishing only, a 20 inch minimum size, one fish per day in 2017. Those, just for you know, reference, though, that regulation, that fly fishing only regulation is identical to the regulations on Mossy Creek here in nearby Augusta County. So that became uh, the South River Upper here and became the second fly fishing only stream in Virginia in 2017. And as I've shown in previous slides and pictures and maps it's all about groundwater uh, influence so these are there's significant sources of spring groundwater inputs in this reach which allows the trout to do well 12 months a year again city spring and it's even interesting and this is i wish i had a video to really show this but it would probably crash the system but uh there are springs at upwell in the river channel in this area and here's one here it's in, the, in that black circle there uh, which is really it's really interesting to see you don't see that many places like as an artesian type of upwelling again more temperature data there again this was critical for when uh, these trout enthusiasts in the local area were interested in, in, in doing something and stocking trout and developing trout fisheries and as well as you know before uh, the department of wildlife resources gets involved we're gonna say well let's let's look our do we have the habitat available there? And where is that habitat available in this upper reach of South River where we could develop a trout fishery? And so the take home here is the temperatures adequate to support trout year round don't start until you get downstream of Lipscomb Road. And from there, you know, keep your eye on the 75 degree line um, on the Y axis is we don't see those temperatures get above 75 until we get down to past the, the confluence of Back Creek, which we're down in that area where the current SRA ends there at uh, Oak Lane. Here is a typical look at what the, uh, the reach looks in that S S South River SRA. I believe this picture is taken looking downstream off the Shalom Road Bridge. There's an angler enjoying a beautiful, beautiful sunny day. Uh, one concession to these private landowners that, that our TU chapter members, uh, you know, kind of negotiated with was that anglers would need to obtain a, a free fishing permit, basically a permission slip to be able to fish uh, this, this section of South River. And it's similar to a program that we have at Mossy Creek and Buffalo Creek, and that if the rules were broken, uh, the, that angler would lose their, their permission slip. And uh, these are, these permits were originally issued out of the, the Department of Wildlife Resources office in Verona and at several businesses in the Waynesboro area. But then um, we kind of came into the 21st century a few years later uh, and made it available where these, these permits could be issued online on our website. So at the same time a, a, a fisherman, an angler, goes to purchase their fishing license or trout license, they could also uh, pick up these uh, landowner permits. And this also allows D, uh, DWR to more accurately determine the number of permits that are being issued, the number, of, and subsequently 
be able to survey those individuals and get some valuable information to help manage these fisheries. And I'll share some of that in a little bit here. So here's the meat and potatoes here. So now we've, we've determined we have the cold water habitat. We got landowner permission. We got the regulations in place. Well, now it's time to start playing Johnny Trout Seed to see uh, you know, what's the right recipe, if you will, that's going to build this fishery. You know, all streams are different. There is no standard stocking rate uh, or size of fish, strain of fish, uh, species of trout that are going to do what it's, it's kind of a, a trial and error process. And that's what we started in 20, 2008. And so this is not a complete uh, history of the stocking. I think this goes to 2016. But um, you can see we, we tried brook, brown, and rainbow. I think the next slide, is we, we actually stocked some brook trout in there. There's different, they come from different hatcheries. We stocked them at different times, different densities, at different sizes. And uh, so what we've really gotten to there is now after, after 15 years or so, as we're settled on stocking six to seven inch, which we call advanced fingerling, uh, brown and rainbow trout, about 5,000 each uh, in, the, in the late September, early October time period, and then coming back the following March and stocking several thousand uh, larger adult 10 to 12 inch brown trout. And we've been doing that uh, for the past several years, and it seems that that is, you know, we're having more success. But that's not to say that uh, we're not thinking about uh, trying some different, different stocking strategies. And so here's another table with a lot of numbers on it. And I just really threw this up here to emphasize that at this time. So in 2016, uh, local interest here started raising money to purchase trout uh, from private hatcheries to stock in the SRA. And, uh, and they're also stocking uh, uh, catchable size trout in the 12 to 15 inch range uh, in the catch release area downtown. We'll talk a little bit about that, but just wanted a, a shout out there that not only is the department stocking trout, but uh, these local interests, these local anglers are also stocking trout. So how does DWR evaluate the success of these stockings? Uh, we've surveyed the SRA at two stations uh, to look at trout survival and growth annually, usually in the late summer under, under lower flow conditions when we have a, more, a, a better chance of, of of capture efficiency since about 2008. Uh, we may have missed a year over, over that time period, but we have a pretty good data set. And uh, so this is Harold Tate here with a, with, a, with a nice brown trout that originated as a six to seven inch hatchery fish over probably two, two, two years in the, in the upper river, grew to this, this size, you know, very, you know, looks, quite wild. I mean, their, their fins grow out at this time, they get colored up. And so, uh, you know, to, to the untrained eye, this, this could be interpreted as a wild fish, which is, which is not, but. Um, so here's some of the data, just a smattering of this electric fishing data that the, the, the Department of Wild Resources collects in assessing these fisheries. And um, here on the y-axis is the number of fish caught per hour of electric fishing. That metric is what fisheries biologists use all over the world as a, as a, as a metric to uh, assess the, the relative abundance of, of fish. And so you might ask, well, what, how, what do those numbers represent? How, what are they, how do they compare? Well, I can say that there's going to be natural variability in those numbers from year to year for a number of reasons, depending on the flow, the flow regime of the river throughout that previous year, also maybe uh, what the flow was like when the fish were stocked, uh, what the, uh, also what the conditions were like when we were sampling. If we were sampling under different conditions, a little higher water, maybe more difficult. So that affects our numbers. So it's not an exact uh, estimate, but it's, it's you know, we, we do the best we can. But to get back to what I was asked, was, was saying, you might be saying to yourself, well, what, are the, what do those numbers mean? These numbers, as far as fish per hour electric fishing are similar in other fisheries where we're stocking trout like Mossy Creek or Buffalo Creek in Rockbridge County. So there's not a whole lot of difference there. So, um, 
So you may ask yourself, I just looked at these, chart, these, these tables and we're stocking thousands of fish. Why do we have to continually annually stock thousands of trout in the South River? What happens to all of them? I mean, where do they go? Well, we know that survival of these hatchery trout is relatively poor in the SRA. And we've observed that in other uh, systems as well. It's not, that's not, they just, they're not wild. They don't have the, the instincts, the attributes that wild fish have, you know, to, to uh, evade predators and things like that. They just don't persist. Um, and like I said, we've, we've observed this in other systems like South River, as well as other fish wildlife agencies have observed the same thing in, in, in stock trout supported fisheries throughout the Southeast, Northeast, it's not uncommon. Um, we're, we're losing fish to more natural mortality, avian predators. Um, we see evidence of injuries on fish from avian predators. Um, there's, a, there's a very vibrant river otter population on the South River. So, you know, but the, those, are, those are natural native predators. And so um, that they're, part, they're part of the ecosystem. Um, Poaching, illegal harvest. There's certainly some of that going on. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying that. That's we don't have. A, that's one of those unknowns. You don't have that hard data to say. Well, you know, how many are are, are going home illegally? Uh, emigration is probably the biggest reason that we're seeing these fish. And there's been some. We've done a little bit of uh, work. We've marked fish that we've been able to to, to determine that they've moved out of a system. There's other researchers that have done done some work and published. Uh, that the same thing is occurring. That's just one of those, and it varies by species. It, it, sometimes it's by system, and, and it's really hard to, to pin down what is the main reason those fish are, are not sticking around. Is it, you know, why aren't they there? And, and some of it could also be in a system like South River where summer temperatures, you know, summer temperatures start to get a little, where they're a little uncomfortable. They're make, they might move looking for uh, cool water refugia. Um, But saying all that, we uh, plan to explore different stocking strategies, as I mentioned, from what we're currently doing. I mean, uh, there's still some tools in our, left in our toolbox that we could try um, to improve survival of, of these hatchery fish. That could be stocking different strains that we haven't tried already. Uh, and ultimately, I'll talk a little bit about, I guess I'll mention it now, is it'd be great if we and that's the ultimate goal of the pie in the sky is if we could support, develop, create uh, a wild trout, natural reproducing, self-supported trout fishery where we wouldn't ever have to stock a hatchery fish again. That's, that's the ultimate goal. You know, where, where are we on that spectrum of getting there? Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll mention here a little bit about some things we're seeing with natural reproduction in the South River. But So there's some tools in the toolbox we have uh, with our stocking strategies, but I, I, I said earlier about some of the re some things we have with uh, to learn about our, our trout fishermen and what what they mean to the, the the fishery and economically. So these are these the permit holders. You can see here that these anglers how much they fished the South River in 2015. We 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 asked people that got a permit in 2016 or 2015 we surveyed them and, and you can see your angling pressure in 2015 was greater on the South River uh, special reg area than it was on Mossy Creek which has been around since the 1970s so that I think speaks for itself right there that this is a this is a popular fishery and it's vibrant and then getting back to the what's the economic value of these fisheries to the local area we can use some metrics and some calculators off of this of how far anglers are traveling. The, you know, unlike some of our put and take fisheries, trout fisheries, which I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, uh, these special regulation trout fisheries uh, are, they bring people from far and wide. And so that's, that's something to, to remember here about how, how they're important economically to the region. Okay, so we talked about the South River upper here. We're going to move down river now to our next trout fishery, which is in Ridgeview Park. 
Ridgeview Park, there's about a three quarter of a mile stretch there uh, that with the blessings of the city of Waynesboro in 2000, uh, Department of Wild Resources uh, started stocking uh, this reach of South River as a, as a designated stock trout water. It's, it's a category A water, which means it, it's, it receives eight stockings uh, between October 1st and May 31st and a separate trout license is required to fish this area October 1st through June 15th. Uh, so our agency's traditional put and take program like we, we have here at Ridge, Ridgeview Park uh, is where we stock catchable size, rainbow and brown trout primarily. We, do, we will stock brook trout in the South River at Ridgeview when we have some available. And this is, I mentioned earlier, we have, you know, hopefully 100,000 trout anglers out there. Uh, by and large, vast majority of them, this is the, the fisheries that they target. And these are more local fisheries from the research and the surveys we've done than those special regulation fisheries. And I just wanted to mention this, that not only, this goes along the lines with the development of these fisheries. So, you know, the, the, the TU chapter, uh, did the legwork to get permission from private landers in, in the upper re river. Well, what can we do to improve access for anglers? In 2003, uh, the city of Waynesboro, our agency, and some other, uh, other uh, funding partners came together and constructed a handicapped accessible fishing pier in Ridgeview Park. It's benefiting these trout anglers. And I just met uh, a week ago with city of Waynesboro Parks and Recs uh, staff and we're talking about developing some more ADA accessible fishing platforms at Ridgeview Park. They're going to be right on the, the level of the water. So we're excited about that. And also not just uh, we're still looking at ways we can improve the habitat for trout. And this is in Ridgeview Park. R R River was uh, suffering from uh, bank erosion. You can see there's very little trout habitat here. It's very wide, very shallow. In 2013, our agency, along with the city of Waynesboro, came in, uh, did some stream restoration work in the channel, actually improved uh, bank erosion. You can see consolidated the water, uh, in increased the depth of the water, the flow, uh, habitat, which benefits all aquatic organisms and our trout fishery there. So those are some things that we're doing online. Another uh, habitat improvement project that benefited uh, these trout, the development of these trout fisheries was the removal of the Ripe Loft Dam, also known as the Ramworks Dam in 2011. So there was, you know, there was, there, there were multiple objectives here when removing uh, this dam, which is just downstream of Ridgeview Park, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar where it was. Um, one was, it, it was, a, it was a barrier for fish, for, for migrating fish or you know, even fish that aren't migratory, all fish species, there's been a lot of research done, they need to be able to move to find different habitats, different times of year. So removing that dam, we may not have anadromous species like American shad that would, that would, be, uh, it would be a roadblock here for them to make to their spawning grounds, but there's other resident fish species that are gonna benefit from the removal of this. But the, the, a, a very important uh, response from removing this dam was not only to, we took the river back from the impounded pool uh, habitat, which wasn't really beneficial for a lot of rivering fish species, back to its original uh, stream habitat, which is benefit. And the most important here was we helped improve the temperature in a downward uh, uh, way. So, Impounded water, when it's impounded, it warms up. And so we were able to gain a few degrees here, which are very critical. We're, we're always at that teetering point of trout habitat. So this graph just shows in the summer, summer months, pre-dam removal, post-dam removal, that we did actually improve uh, trout habitat, that cooler water uh, in that reach of river. Okay, now, this is the, the, the good stuff. Uh, Going to talk, we're going to move downstream from Ridgeview Park in, in the old Ramworks Dam. We're now in downtown Waynesboro, Constitution Park, known as the catch and release area. 
This is the reach from Wayne Avenue downstream to North Park. It's currently known as like, the catch release area. It's about a little over two miles in length. It flows through Constitution Park, and now there's a, a beautiful, lovely greenway that parallels the river uh, down through there, and it's gonna be extended all the way down to North Park. As I understand, it's, it's, that's great for improving angler access to, to this fishery, but as well as just, you know, non-anglers to enjoy the river and the wildlife the river, the river, the river has. Um, a separate trout license is also required to fish this catch release section. Uh, harvested trout is prohibited and anglers must use single point hook artificial lures only. This catch and release regulation went to, into effect in 2017. Um, before that, this is kind of special and I mentioned at the beginning of my my presentation about those two individuals, DeBose Eggleston and uh, Corbin Dixon, who were still instrumental in, in getting the, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries at the time to st talk, stock some trout into downtown Waynesboro. Uh, in 1989, uh, that happened. It was the first delayed harvest stock trout water in Virginia. So that was, that was kind of a monumental, um, uh, watershed moment, I guess, if you, at the time. There are currently 15 streams that are in this delayed harvest program statewide. So this was the first, so you can be proud of that. Uh, so how many trout, what species of trout are being stocked, had been stocked, or currently being stocked in this catch and release uh, reach? So this did not change, so this, Start, this, this has not changed from when it was a delayed harvest. So we were, when it was delayed harvest back in the 1990s, let's say, or early 2000s, we were still stocking around 1,000 trout three times a year, uh, once in early October, then in December, January, and then once in April. Uh, primarily about 50-50 brown and rainbow trout. These are catchable size now. We try to you know average 11 inches. That's what we're kind of shooting for. And um, so that hasn't changed. But I want to make note here that the private interests that I talked about that are raising money to stock uh, additional trout, are all, they're stocking them in the, in the SRA. They're also stocking in the catch relief section. And it's, uh, you know, Tommy can correct me if I'm wrong here. I, hopefully I, I got this right. But it, it's, they've been, since I think 2016 or 17, they've been stocked. 2012, okay, so it goes back that far. Been stocking upwards of 2,000, maybe even 2,500 trout a year in there on top of what the state is already stocking. So there's a lot of trout going into this reach of the river as well as the upper river. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And uh, this, this is a, a, a table that isn't up to date, it goes to 2018, but this is the history of uh, private trout stocking going back in, in the delayed harvest catch release area goes back to 2015. So maybe I'm not as accurate there is I, I should be, Tommy, apologize for that, but. We only did one stocking in 12, and I think we only did two in 13 mm -hmm. and 14. So there's, there's a lot of uh, interest, like I said, and support from, uh, from uh, the, the individuals and, and organizations that are, that are contributing money to purchase these, these, trout, these extra trout to this fishery. And like I said, it's, the interest is there because of, uh, you know, pictures like this get out on social media, and the first question is, where did it come from? And and that's where everybody wants to go. So that's, I guess, my little plug for how social media can really help, uh, you know, promote uh, and, and bring, bring support for for some of your programs. But another positive uh, thing we've seen that I want to mention here within the, the catch and release area. This is downtown area, and this is, I think, directly um, uh, a direct response from that groundwater infusion that's so, that's so important here. We have seen, we have documented some uh, natural reproduction of rainbow trout. Limited, but not, you know, it, it, it's a little more substantial some years than others. Uh, I think most likely, a lot of it can be attributed to maybe some higher than normal river flows in 2018 and 19. There was probably a little bit of reproduction prior to that by rainbow trout. This is very encouraging. Like I said, that the pie in the sky maybe we're, we're all shooting for is where we could improve the habitat that we have, that we have to work with here 
you know, take advantage of that cold water and develop wild reproducing trout. That's, you know, so it, it, it is possible. Uh, and it's, you know, now whether or not uh, it would be ever, we could ever get it to the level that would support a fishery, uh, that's, that's the $100,000 question, but we at least know that it's possible. So the jury's still out. Um, whether we can develop wild reproducing populations of brook rainbow or brown trout in the South River. So some more of this electric fishing data that, that DWR collects. Uh, this isn't most up to date, but we started uh, electric fishing from the railroad bridge upstream to the confluence of Baker Spring or the outflow of Baker Spring uh, in 2014, netting all the trout we encountered and are, we're pretty efficient, but um, we don't catch them all. We're probably netting probably about 80% of them, I would gather. I mean, some people could argue that, but that's, I feel pretty confident we're getting a lot of them. And we do this in, in the late summer when, when the, the stream flows are down. But on the uh, x-axis here is uh, trout per 100 meters. So that's a little different metric than the trout per hour of electric fishing. So this is if you're wading or walk, wading up the river or walking up the greenway, you know, you're walking by in, in, in 2017, you know, eight rainbow and eight brown trout per, per 100 meters there. Uh, and that's, like I said, probably a little lower estimate than what's actually out there. And you may note here that we have picked some brook trout up here um, in, in low numbers. Uh, some of those were hatchery fish, but there were some hatchery brook trout that were mixed in, uh, I believe in 2017. There are those one or two rogue uh, wild brook trout that I, we haven't been able to verify whether wild they could be uh, trout in the classroom. It's a trout unlimited program uh, where they're releasing uh, juvenile brook trout uh, into the South River. So they, they may or may not be truly wild, but um, so there again, what makes the holdovers potential, the growth and the support of these trout in this downtown area? It's the groundwater, it's the spring water. Baker Spring, again, 3,000 gallons per minute. There again, that temperature is so important, 56 degrees uh, coming out of the ground. Um, and so South River in the Waynesboro area, that catch release section, in the short term, is still most likely going to have to remain a hatchery supported fishery for the reasons I've discussed. You know, the temperature is marginal, and that, the, you know, so it, it, depending on how wet and cool a summer we have, so from year to year, those, those holdover conditions are going to be different. Uh, you have competition with resident fish, other species that are wild. Uh, we have to, we're dealing with the, uh, you know, the mortality issue and the, the emigration issue. But we're going to continue as an agency to investigate these different stocking strategies, maybe moving wild fish in there to see if they have a uh, better chance of survival and reproduction. Uh, and so those things we're, we're looking forward to. But ultimately, I want to impress that uh, the protection of those groundwater springs, uh, without that, it's, it's, it's a game changer. It's not possible. So if there was going to be a, a major alteration, reduction in flow, or a temperature change in those, in those major springs that feed the South River, um, the, the, the idea of, of, of a wild trout population is, is, a, is, is, is a dream. So that's why it's so important to do what we can to protect uh, not only the flow, but the quality of those springs. And uh, another variable that, that has led to increased trout habitat here, again, more, some, more stream restoration work. This is in the downtown area. This picture's a little dated. You can see this is before the Greenway, so this is in the early 2000s. Um, and so these, these, these projects that were, that were done by Department of Wildlife Resources and the city of Waynesboro are meant to reduce stress on the stream banks and stream bank erosion, but also provide better uh, physical habitat for trout and other aquatic uh, organisms and fish. And I want to mention that I know Trout Unlimited has done some of this stream restoration work up in the SRA area, Upper South River, so there's, there's always room to do more of this work uh, throughout the South River uh, that's going to improve um, habitat for, for trout. 
in some of these pictures of these structures in downtown as they were being constructed. And that's a whole nother presentation itself about how these are designed, how they're operated to work, what the, what the objectives are. But these are just some before, during, after. Um, and here you an angler taking advantage of one of these. So, okay, the final stretch here, everybody stay with me, uh, is our last trout fishing or trout fishery, trout fishing opportunity that we uh, develop on the South River is at Basic Park. We surveyed our trout anglers back in 2014 and 2015 and asked them what they'd like to see with, our, with the department's trout program you know what changes they'd like to see or or, diff or alterations and one of the most uh, uh, biggest responses most important responses for the majority of anglers that we interviewed and surveyed was you need to provide more op fish, trout fishing opportunities for youth for children and so we did that in 2017 we created or established seven youth only stock trout waters. One of them was at, at uh, Basic Park. And here are some photos from happy, successful anglers at uh, Basic Park, this new youth only stock trout water. It is a youth only, age 15 and under only, uh, between April 1st and June 15th. The daily limit is three trout per day per angler. Uh, DWR is stocking these areas three times uh, and those those stockings have been pre-announced and it's been very popular it's the very you know in this we had we got permission from all these landowners for these seven waters that's really it was very instrumental the city of Waynesboro you know sitting down with them and saying yeah we'd like we're interested in doing that so uh, and here again this has been very popular and um, you know it's just another thing with with that improvement in water quality over time this wouldn't have been possible 25 years ago you know the water quality was, was that poor that we couldn't even stock trout to survive in that water for more than a, a few hours probably so you know another this is a, the fruits of, of cleaning up the South River over time so lastly before everybody falls asleep I, I wanted to kind of just show how where we've got some data it may not be specific right to the South River, these South River fisheries, but how, you know, what's the economic importance of these trout fisheries to Waynesboro and Augusta County? So uh, determining the economic value of a fishery is difficult. Fisheries managers have often struggled to obtain reasonably accurate data. You know, we're most interested in, you know, who's fishing for what, how much they're fishing, uh, what species they're fishing for, how satisfied they are, and we, you know, secondary, we say, well, you know, how much money did you spend on this fishing trip today and that kind of thing. Well, we're, we're getting away from that. We're, we're more interested in collecting some information from them that can help us put a dollar figure on the importance of these fisheries. And so these are trout fisheries that were surveyed, angler krill surveys over time there in Virginia, and that data generated an average trip expenditure, what the average cost a fisherman spent on that fishing trip and you can see they, they range from $24 at the Smith River Tailwater in, South, in, in, in Southside Virginia to almost $60 at White Top Oil Creek in 2000. So that's kind of the range there. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does a, conducts a national hunting and fishing and outdoor recreation survey every five years. Well, the, the, the 2016 survey the average fishing trip expenditure, now that's, that's all fish, that's not, or all fishing trips, that's not specific to trout, that was $47. So those are hard numbers that you can take, uh, managers can take, economists can take, and extrapolate, calculate um, what an overall expenditure economic value is for these fisheries. And so, and more recently, uh, human, to human dimensions experts have uh, started just looking at asking, uh, using a zip code, you know, obtaining a zip code and then calculating how far an angler is traveling one way to get to that fishing, fishing resource. 
and they could generate a trip expenditure off of that. So there again, that's, that's where the importance of this data comes in. Now that we can track how many of these permits that we're issuing for people fishing the South River SRA. And so they ranged from 2,000 to almost 3,500 permits were being issued. And we surveyed some of those anglers in 2015 and said, well, how, you know, to find how far they're traveling, and you can see these are not local fisheries. Like I mentioned earlier about some of the put and take fisheries like at Ridgeview Park or the youth area, these anglers uh, are drawn to these special regulation areas and they're coming from far away. And so they're, they're spending more money uh, in the local area. Now, we have more data on the South River that was collected for uh, the entire South River, so not just uh, from, from, from Constitution Park all the way on down to, to uh, Port Republic back in 2016, just showing the dollars spent here. So we have some information to kind of put a value on the fisheries resources of the South River. Not, you know, and here's just some more of that data uh, thrown together. Um, and there I want to mention that a lot of these estimates are on the low side. They're, they're low ball. They're, it, it's, it's very hard to, uh, you know, they're not meant, they weren't meant as a, a trickle down uh, estimate. So they're on, on the low side. So with that, I need to wake everybody up. And uh, <laughs> uh, thank you again for having me tonight and, and listening to all that, me rambling on there about everything with the South River, but I, I'm, you know, uh, very appreciative of everybody's interest in uh, developing these these fisheries in, in, in Waynesboro in the local area. Um, and with that, I'd be more than happy to take any questions if we have time for them. I'm not sure what the, what the program is here. Depends on the, the, the life cycle of the trout, the age of the trout. So and these trout are, are sack fry. You know, there's uh, other fall fish. Uh, you know, in the South River, we have smallmouth bass, largemouth bass. Uh, we've, we've captured black crappie out here. So there's certainly uh, native fish and some introduced fish species that, are, that would prey upon young trout. Now, an adult trout that gets up to 12, 13 inches. There's not much out there here that's going to pose a threat on the on the fishery side. Now you've got avian predators, you've got river otters that are, that, you know, very good at, at capturing fish. Water snakes. Water snakes. The herons. The herons. The herons. The herons. Osprey. Bald eagles. Bald eagles. Yeah. So there's you know there's there's more. That's a great recovery story there, the osprey and bald eagles. I mean, I remember when I started working here over 20 years ago, it was, it was uncommon to see an osprey or bald eagle. Now, anywhere in, in the valley, if you're close to water, it's, it's a, they're, they're a common sight. So. Well, I'm trying to say, well, essentially, animals have had to adjust, not just us, but the regular animals, the wonderful are they adjusting, despite everything you've shown, are the fish adjusting to? I mean, yeah, I, I think are we are. observing that, especially with this change I, in climate? Right, climate change, I think, uh, trying to answer your question, but I think what you're asking is, there. yeah, they will adjust, but they have a limited range that they can adjust. And, you know, one way they adjust is, is movements. And just like terrestrial animals are going to migrate yeah. to where habitats are seeking fish, so they have to stay in the water to do that. And that's where it's important that we remove barriers that have been put in place, whether they're dams or uh, improperly installed culverts or extreme crossings. Uh, that's, there's, there's a big push to improve those things to allow those fish to migrate sure. to better habitats 
if, if they are facing increasing temperatures and climate change. How high up? Like uh, there's some um, small dams down by Vendesta, the poultry farm. Mm -hmm. How high can the fish jump to get up? Can they get over those and move upstream? That's a great question. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of research done uh, by, 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 by biologists looking at the different species, what, what they can traverse. Um, and I would think that most of the species that are found in the South River are not very good at, uh, are not. Uh, right, they're not Pacific salmon. They're, you know, they don't have a history of that now, yeah. you know, uh, but, but, uh, but th they always amaze me and there are, you know, they don't necessarily have to jump up over if they can stay in the water, mm -hmm. as long as that velocity of water is not too great mm -hmm. and that distance they have to cover, they can make it through there, so. Um, Other than Heron, that's it. That's right. Uh, that's right. 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 Is, that, is he catching fish that are coming down, or is he catching Could fish? Could be both. You know, that, he's, he's there because he knows his fish, they, they need uh, an obstacle when they have to slow down, down uh -huh. and, and kind of, and that's when he takes advantage of that. Yeah. Will, will that dam stay there? The dam we're talking about, I believe, is it's a pipe. It's a sewer. sewer. Is it a sewer? It's a water pipe. Water line. Water line. So, right. But those are those are certainly things that that we, as an agency, would would be would gladly work with the utilities and the owners of, of you know ways to. That's at the just across the line. Yeah. Ways of moving those moving those that are not wanted or altering them that they would be. South River, emigrating. Uh, you know, we'll see uh, trout that were stocked in um, the Waynesboro area or, or Basic Park. We may we may pick them up in some of our surveys way downstream. Now we're stocking the South River again in, in Grand Caverns and Grottos, but we may have done some fish surveys in between there, say in Cremora or wherever we may pick a, a trout or two up so they do move and, and as I said earlier naturally the, the, there are no barriers those fish those wild brook trout that are up in the streams on the Blue Ridge have the ability to come down mm -hmm. so Payne run sawmill run Madison run have the ability big run have the ability to come down during colder months when the water's colder you know swim up swim up or down the South River and, and, and then back up another stream and there's an evidence researchers have looked at genetic material to find out that fish are doing that over time. It may not be every year and every fish, but it, it does happen. And that's, and that's important mm -hmm. to allow them to do that. All right, let's thank Steve for a great talk. I'm sure he'll stick around if you have more questions one-on-one, -on -one, and we will see you next month. So thank you very much.